All rise. Court of Appeals is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the Utah Court of Appeals in a special session at Southern Utah University. This is, by my count, uh, the fifth time when we have held a uh, session of court here on Southern Utah University's beautiful campus. Uh, the fourth time during uh, the presidency of uh, uh, Scott Wyatt. And this has become kind of an annual event and one that we very much look uh, forward to. We get a much better audience here than back at our courthouse in Salt Lake. Uh, and it's very important as we are a court of statewide jurisdiction to periodically hold sessions of court uh, outside Salt Lake City and uh, President Wyatt, Jennifer Oberhelman make it uh, very attractive for us to routinely include Cedar City as one of our, our destinations. We appreciate very much their help in putting this together as well as the help of our court clerk, Lisa Collins, and uh, appreciate Trooper Nielsen for coordinating our security in conjunction with SUU's uh, police department and security staff. Um, and we also appreciate uh, Council's uh, willingness to participate with us here. I hope it is for them, like it is for us, uh, a nice change of, of pace. As I always say, this beautiful hall puts me in mind of Harry Potter with the uh, uh, set of armor at the back and these beautiful banners uh, hanging, and it's, it's really a, a special opportunity for us to be here. Please, if you have not already done so, uh, turn your cell phone to silent mode or turn it right off. It's always very distracting when a cell phone goes off, so much so that when we're in Salt Lake, it's a $100 fine for your cell phone going off in court. So far, you're look looking at the main uh, recipient of those fines. I'm out of pocket $300 at this point for my own cell phone going off, so even as I speak, I'm gonna check mine. We will not enforce that, uh, that rule here. Um, you will not be arrested and you will not be fined if your cell phone goes off, but you will disrupt our proceedings, and so we would very much appreciate it if you would take that moment to, uh, take a moment to silence your cell phone. Our procedure will be to hold this session of court, and this is, like any other session of court, with one exception that I'll mention in just a moment, uh, when court adjourns, instead of leaving, as we typically do, we'll come around to the front of the bench, taking off our robes to make clear that we're no longer in session as judges, and uh, President Wyatt, um, uh, himself a, an attorney, and indeed one who made arguments before the Court of Appeals many, many years ago before he found his way into education will moderate our, our Q&A session. We very much appreciate his willingness uh, to do that. Council will remember that it's, uh, these proceedings are being live streamed and also recorded. And so when you first come to the microphone, and indeed in the case of Appellants Council, when you come back to the microphone, please state your appearance for the record. So if we have occasion to listen to these arguments later, we'll know who is saying uh, what when. The one exception that I wanted to mention is that we allow 15 minutes aside ordinarily for oral argument. And because that time is so short, it's not uncommon for us to just launch right into questions. And a lot of times the audience is sort of left in the dark as to what these cases are all about. Council in this case had the good idea um, to ask for a few extra minutes of time so that they could, from each of their different perspectives, outline the facts, primarily for your benefit. We know about the facts. We've read the briefs. We've had access to the record, so we know what's going on here. But uh, we think it would be nice for the audience to have that same background information. So we're going to try and make a point to refrain from questions during that first five minutes when you each will be 
explaining about the facts. I suspect if we have a question about the facts, per se, we might jump in. Um, but we want to give you that extra time for that, that good reason. And uh, with those preliminaries out of the way, unless I've forgotten something, uh, we'll call the case of uh, uh, State versus Hunt. May it please the court, is this mic working? Yes. I can't tell, okay. May it please the court and counsel, my name is Todd McFarlane. I represent the appellant Marvin J. Hunt in this case, and I'd also like to recognize co-counsel, Willard, attorney Willard Bishop, who has worked on this matter for over five years and tried the underlying case back in 2016. Mr. Hunt's briefing has identified five primar primary assignments of error on appeal involving three primary substantive legal issues. Depending on the court's questions, time will probably not allow me to thoroughly address all of those issues, but fortunately I think that they have been amply briefed. In the interest of time and organization, I'm going to try to stick fairly closely to my notes, but I will be happy to entertain any questions you might have. I'm going to start out by taking just a minute to lay a little foundation. This is a unique case addressing important fundamental policy considerations that are probably long overdue for consideration. Among other things, this case involves a growing conflict between rural and urban America and rural and urban values. While I was recently doing chores on the ranch that my family and I own and operate in Millard County, my little three-year-old granddaughter was helping me do chores and she said, Grandpa, this is the Wild West. I didn't want to burst her bubble about our place, but in some places the Wild West does still exist, and this case has some Wild West elements to it. As we look around the various flags and banners that adorn this grand hall that Judge Orm has referred to, we will find one that proclaims agriculture is the foundation of civilization. I've always enjoyed and appreciated and believed in an old Chinese proverb about that foundational reality that goes something to the effect of lots of food, lots of problems. No food, one problem. This case involves unique foundational issues fundamental to the operation of the Western livestock industry and a unique set of facts from a world that more and more people simply don't no, even still exists. According to the evidence that was presented at trial on the day in question that precipitated the events giving rise to the underlying criminal prosecution, rancher Jay Hunt, the appellant in this case, who was 75 years old at the time, was at his ranch in western Iron County near Modena and the Nevada border. He had just unloaded some new bulls there and wanted to make sure they knew where to find water because there's only about one reliable stock water source in that vast desert valley. Because the bulls started wandering off without finding the water, Hunt quickly saddled a young horse that was available and went to attempt to gather and bring the bulls back to water. As it turns out, that was easier said than done. Among other things, there was a rogue stallion in the area that had been giving hunts a lot of trouble for quite some time. Without going into all the details about the trouble this stud had been causing, according to the evidence presented at trial, the stallion would often charge and assault saddle horses and riders in the area. Mr. Hunt's son, Colby Hunt, testified about multiple encounters and that it had gotten so bad that out of concern for the safety of himself, his father, their family, and their livestock, he tried to always keep a rifle close at hand in case, in his words, it went south with the stallion. According to the evidence presented at trial, as Jay Hunt was trying to gather his new bulls that day, as luck would have it, he ran into the stallion, and things did go south. As the rogue stallion charged Hunt and his saddle horse, and chased them pale-mail and hell-bent for leather back to their corrals. This was the kind of runaway that caused Mr. Hunt to lose complete control of the young horse he was riding 
as they tried to outrun the charging stallion across the desert. But Hunt did eventually manage to get himself and his horse loaded into a stock trailer in an effort to protect them from the angry stallion, which then proceeded to circle the trailer, snort, paw, strike, and try to attack them. This was just the latest in a series of similar encounters. Although in my considered opinion, Mr. Hunt would have been fully justified legally and in every other possible way in doing something known and described in the Wild West that still exists in that world as the three S's, shoot, shovel, and shut up. But rather than doing that, Mr. Hunt chose to exercise lesser force and take a more restrained approach. But at that point, because he'd completely had it with the havoc the rogue stallion was reeking with their ranching operation, as soon as he was safe, he called to recruit his son Colby and a neighbor to come help castrate horses, primarily including a handful of their own young, branded ranch horse colts that were due for that operation, and while they were at it, several feral, astray horses in the area, including the rogue stallion as well. And with your five minutes being taken up at that point, long story short, the stallion was converted from stallion to gelding. That's correct. Without uh, the alleged owner's permission. That's right. So in other words, uh, the question then, and I was going to say the facts as I've uh, described them up to this point, I believe to be undisputed. Mr. Hunt has always taken full ownership and responsibility for his actions and has never disputed the basic essential facts in the case. Among other things, what is disputed, and it goes to your question, and what has been disputed from the outset is who, if anyone, legitimately owned the rogue stallion and several of the other horses, including the young Palomino Pinto, all of which, by statutory definition, were estrays, defined as unbranded horses found running at large under what at the time was Utah Code Section 4-25-1. But Mr. McFarland, why does it matter if he knows that they weren't his horses? Why does it matter whose horses they were? Well, I think if, if we examined that situation, especially in the factual context, uh, first of all, our point, as you know from the briefing, is that our point is that the state has the burden of proving the, ownership, the element of ownership. In other words, these horses, by statutory definition, were estrays. Under applicable law at the time, Iron County was responsible, according to the applicable law at that time, it's been changed now to say may, but at that time it said shall respond and take care of estrays, statutory estrays. And the Hunts had made multiple complaints to the Iron County Sheriff's Department requesting that they take, come and take care of this band of feral astray horses. This was back in the time period of 2008 to 2013 during the recession when there was a corresponding crash in the horse market and there was no shortage of unwanted horses. It wasn't uncommon for people to just come out and dump out horses in the desert and this band of feral astray horses was numbered around 30 that they had to feed water the only water source in that entire area was their stock water and their well at, at their corrals. So in addition to all the other problems, these horses were taking their forage, taking their water from their other livestock, but this particular horse was also causing a lot of problems for them. He was endangering the hunts and their family and their livestock. He was driving them away from water. He was driving them away from feed. So in this case, it's our position, number one, that they were estrays and that Mr. Hunt, under all applicable law, was entitled to exercise reasonable force to protect himself and his property against the threats that presented themselves. It's our position that the state at trial and throughout the case had the burden of proving who did own the horses, and that the only way to do that under applicable law was by a statutory brand inspection. And, and right there, let me just stop you and, and interpose some, some questions. What, I guess I don't understand why the state wouldn't be able, 
I think I agree with you that the state has the burden of demonstrating ownership, and I think the state would agree with that as well. But why couldn't the state prove that in a more conventional way, just the same way they would prove ownership in any garden variety theft case, by putting evidence, putting witnesses on the stand who could testify about who owned that particular piece of property? Why couldn't they do that here? Well, I think the reason why, and let's, let's analogize this to say a vehicle, let's, let's say a car theft, for example, and there was a dispute over ownership of the car. Of course, a party could get on the witness stand and say, well, that car belonged to me, and someone else could say, no, it belonged to me, and there could have been a question, they may have said, well, we just found the car, and so we exercised possession of the car, but ultimately, under applicable Utah law, it usually boils down to whose name is on the certificate of title. Right, but there are lots of types of property that don't have any sort of certificate of title. Let's say a jewelry theft in a house or a, a, a scenario that comes up a lot is where drugs are found somewhere. Somebody's accused of possessing those drugs and the state has to prove whose drugs they are in order for a conviction to be obtained. There's no question that's the case and that, that's a real good question. My point is that is not the case with livestock. Livestock are in a different category and the state legislature has set up an entire statutory regime to deal with that. And they have said, as part of that whole statutory policy that's, that's, that's basically articulated in Utah Code Section 4-24, was dash 12 at that time, now renumbered to 4-24-303, to the effect that a brand inspector, as an agent of the Department of Agriculture, shall verify livestock ownership by conducting a brand inspection. But isn't the legislature's intent in that section to try to resolve ownership disputes between two citizens rather than employ that in this criminal context? I think as far as we're concerned, it was the state legislature's intent to apply that regime to any situation where the question of livestock ownership might be in question. And there's a whole spectrum of situations where that might be the case. Well, I mean, how is livestock defined as in, in this scenario? Is it defined by the criminal statute under which Mr. Hunt was charged? I mean, that's the definition we have to apply, right? As far as the definition of livestock, right. uh, the definition livestock are defined in that. Well, I take that back. They are now under Section 76. 76.611b. Se 6.111b at the time, and I'll have to go back and look exactly what it said at that time, because as you know, a lot of these laws have changed and been renumbered in the meantime, and I'm not sure. I know that one of the others that I was reviewing, uh, they'd added a lot more detail in terms of the definition of livestock, uh, but at that time, yes, livestock were to some extent defined under the criminal statute, which was 76. 76, uh, 111B. Right. So is your position that any time the state alleges uh, a criminal violation of that statute, they have to prove ownership of livestock through brand ownership inspection? Well, it's our position, Your Honor, that the state has the burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And there are plenty of cases that say that the state has the burden of proving every element of the offense beyond reasonable doubt. And it's our position that according to applicable state law in the brand section, the state legislature has taken a position as a matter of policy that the only way to verify ownership of livestock is by brand inspection, which results in a livestock brand inspection certificate that is the functional equivalent of a certificate of title. And I think this whole line of questioning really applies in spades to one of these horses in particular. With respect to one of the horses... Well, just, I'm, sure. I'm still, I still am, am struggling with the argument a little bit because the way livestock is defined in subsection B of 76.6.111, it includes more than just horses. It includes cattle, sheep, goats, swine, mules, and poultry. And it just doesn't seem... I mean, if your argument is that the state has to prove ownership basically in one way only, and that is through a brand inspection, and if we're talking about uh, destruction of poultry, for instance, that doesn't seem possible. I, I, don't, 
I mean, I, I am from the big Ch city, but, I'm, don't get but I'm, not, I'm not sure that chickens get branded, and maybe you can correct me about that, but, but there seems to be uh, some livestock under this statute that wouldn't fit into a brand inspection regime. Do you follow my question? I, I do follow that, and I, and I agree with respect to poultry. It talks about brands or marks, and it's not uncommon at all for, for any category of livestock, including poultry, to be marked in some way, including leg bands. If you look at the statute that applies to estrays, and it defines, and it even includes mink, and it talks about them being unbranded. But the thing we need to understand here is brands or marks. And the other thing that we need to understand is it's not the brand itself or the mark itself that is proof of ownership. It's the certificate of brand inspection. There are a lot of livestock, whether they're raised on a farm, dairy cattle are an exemption, and some other things, all of which may not need to be branded, but they all require a certificate of brand inspection for proof of ownership. That's what the statute says, and it explains exactly how that happens. That's the only means the state legislature has ever provided to verify. It's pretty plain. 17 simple words. I'm just going to mention that... Uh, We're about out of time, probably. You're, you've got five minutes reserved for rebuttal, and you're free right. to forge ahead, but it will be uh, cutting into your rebuttal time. Right, yes. So at this point, uh, I, I, unless you have any other questions that you want me to address before we get to rebuttal, uh, I'll yield my time. Very good. Thank you. We'll, Thank we'll you. hear from the state. All right. I'll gather up my stuff here. Mr. Gray, if you would begin with the, the state's own uh, view of the facts, the reason you have the extra five minutes is so that we can uh, educate the audience a little bit about the background here in a way that is not typical. So long as you're talking about facts, we'll refrain from uh, our usual interruptions and questions. All right. Uh, Jeff Gray, appear, uh, appearing on behalf of the state, uh, may it please the court and counsel. Just a couple of things on, on the facts. I think, you know, I'm no cowboy, and I, I don't pretend to be a cowboy. Um, but based on a review of the record, I, I, think, I think it's important to note, uh, just as a background, is that when uh, Alan Bailey first arrived on the property, actually his testimony was that he penned up his horses. And Mr. Jay Hunt came to him and said, you know, you really don't need to do this. Uh, we treat this as free range. Uh, they're, they're, they're free to go. And, and so from, from that point on, um, Mr. Bailey allowed his horses to run free without being penned up, as, as did Mr. Hunt and others uh, in that area. Um, now, this was despite county ordinances that required fencing. Uh, the landowners pretty much ignored that and allowed their cattle or horses to, to roam free. Um, now, the other thing is, is that horses and cattle, apparently, based on the testimony, and, and I rely on the testimony of Jay Hunt and his son Colby Hunt, don't necessarily mix well. Um, as long as they're out on the open range and, you know, there was plenty of range out there, uh, they, they, they pretty much were, were fine. Uh, the problem came when uh, the cattle, when the hunts would herd their cattle into the corral or into an area to feed them or to water them. And then the horses, not just Confetti Magic, who's the, who's the stallion at, at issue in this the case. The victim, as it were. <laughs> yes. Um, but, but they all would. And, and there's no doubt he was the alpha male. Uh, he, he ran the, the show, but he ran the show with respect to all the horses. So when they were herding, and, and quite frankly, this is one of the problems, is when, when these cattle were in, in basically being rounded up to, to feed or to water, the horses saw it, and they all came running. And Confetti Magic behaved essentially like the other horses did in the beginning, and, but pretty soon he rose to the top in the pecking order and became the more aggressive, but they all would crowd out the cattle. And these horses not, in, not only included 
the Bailey's horses, but also included the Hunt's horses. And, and they all came. In fact, on the April 27th incident, um, Bailey horses and Hunt horses were all involved because he ended up corralling multiple of those horses at the time and then uh, gelded you know, three of his own and, and two of Mr. Bailey's. So, and, and there's no doubt, but what, what was, uh, and, and also in that, my review of the record shows that um, I, I didn't see any testimony that he lost control of his horse, uh, Mr. Hunt, during that April 27th incident. He was concerned, it was a young colt, um, and he was concerned about the aggressive nature of that, and so he raced to the trailer. I also saw no testimony whatsoever that he actually pinned himself into the trailer. His testimony was is that he jumped off his horse, put his horse in the trailer, and then stood, quote, stood around there. And Confetti Magic came, circled the, the trailer about three times, and then the other horses caught up, and then they went to water in the corral, and that's when Mr. Hunt uh, locked, locked them all into the corral. So again, and the state doesn't dispute the testimony uh, that confetti magic was particularly aggressive, uh, but he was able to be handled short of castration uh, many times. Um, Colby Hunt testified that uh, he was able to throw rocks at him or uh, strike him with, with, with his rope and, and he would generally back off. Um, so, and he also, as far as coming at his horse, he would square him up, and that caused uh, confetti magic to pause. So that's primarily the incidents, and, and, and so that, that's the context. And again, I mean, should have they been fenced in? I'm not, we're, we're, the state's not disputing that. Um, so, But so, I, I took it from your brief that the justification argument is unavailing for Mr. Hunt because of the delay between corralling all of the horses, including Confetti Magic, and then going to get the neighbor to help with the procedures. Yes, I mean, okay, f basically he proposed to two different jury instructions. And what he's claiming is defense of himself or others. All right, self-defense of himself or others, that's one of the claims. And even in that instruction, he identifies imminence as one of the elements. And in fact... So, so if, if Mr. Hunt had pulled out his gun and shot Confetti Magic in the moment where Confetti Magic was charging him, would they be entitled to a self-defense well, that would be a, under those facts? That, that would be a jury question if the facts supported that, yes. But so you're, so you're, the argument that they're not entitled to it is basically premised on, as Judge Toomey asked, it's premised on the delay or the... That, that's right. And, and if you look at State v. Burial, which is involving a, 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 a person, um, they were, uh, a father and son were very concerned about their daughter and the safety risk that uh, I believe it was her ex-boyfriend uh, represented to them. And the court made clear that um, past conduct or threats of future conduct does not justify somebody in, in, in self-defense. It's, it's just not done. And their defendant has cited to no case that would suggest that it's different for animals. And again, I would point to their own instructions on the self-defense. Their own instructions identify imminence. And there's no doubt that by the time he corrals the horse, he is no longer in danger. And in fact, it appears that he stood there as the horse came and, and then circled the trailer three times. But in any event, let's assume that he went into that trailer with his horse. He got out and he penned the horse. The, the horse did not represent a risk to him and that is required. Um, and, and, and if you're gonna apply it to animal, if you're gonna apply it to people, certainly you apply it to animals. Um, and, you know, the statute, quite frankly, I mean, there's, uh, opposing counsel discusses the Wild West, and, and quite frankly, it does sound like the Wild West. Mr. Hunt decided to exercise some self-help. 
He had reported it to authorities. Um, Detective or Deputy Raditz identified twice that there were any formal complaints to the sheriff's office. One was about dogs and the other one was about his horses. Um, but assuming he, he had, had and, and quite frankly, what we know is that he had had it. He said it himself. They came in, that's it, I've had it. Okay, he, he didn't want to go to authorities. And, and there are measures, I mean, the statute provides, I mean, let's, let's take a look at what he could have done. Um, you know, one of the things that he says is he mentioned it to an animal control officer, the animal control officer in the area whom he knew. And what did the animal control officer tell him? The animal control officer said, well, if you see him running at large, let me know and I'll take care of it. Now, he never did that in this instant, never. And he later testified about a page later in the, in the record that, uh, that this animal control officer doesn't answer his phone. But he never testified as to you know, how often he tried or, or whatnot. But in fact, that's what the statute requires. Um, let's go to section four, let me see, four, chapter 25, uh, section 202. And that is, puts the, the burden on somebody that finds an astray to contact the animal control officer who can then take possession of the astray and practical, determine ownership. I'm sorry, Mr. Gray, but as a practical matter, isn't that going to be difficult in this vast area of West Desert? You can call animal control and they can be responsive, but it's going to take a while to get there and we've got an animal that's <coughs> moving around and can move around quite quickly. Sure, so and, and I guess if, if that's difficult, then take that up with the legislature. I mean, what the legislature has provided is that's the duties that they impose uh, on the parties. You notify the animal control officer and the animal control officer then captures it or he can authorize the owner or, or not the owner, but the, the finder of the astray to take possession of it and maintain and care for it. He didn't do that. That was his responsibility under the statute and that's something that was available to him. And instead, he decided to go basically wild west. I've had it with these horses, I'm gonna do it. There's other things he could have done. He could have fenced in his property as is required by the ordinance. Now, of course, so could Jay Hunt. And Jay Hunt, or not Jay Hunt, but Alan Bailey, uh, so too could have Alan Bailey. And, but each is responsible for their own conduct. Um, what else could have he had done? He could have filed an injunction in court and got a temporary restraining order. This is how we operate. We don't operate in the Wild West anymore. But that's exactly how Mr. Hunt operated in this case. Before your time is up, let's talk for a minute about how the state establishes ownership. The state establishes ownership like it does in any other case, as Judge Harris, Harris noted. Ownership, in fact, how does, let's turn to Title IV. You know, it even, the, the old statute even referenced bill of sale which the state produced. Now, his claim on appeal isn't that the state didn't provide bill of sale or testimony that it was uh, Bailey's horse. His claim is, is the state's required to show that it has a certificate of, of uh, brand inspection. Okay, that can't even be found in the title that he points to. Nowhere in there does it say that ownership can only be established through brand inspection? Nowhere. And, and that's if we look at 424. Now, there are requirements of brand inspection, but it doesn't suggest that's the only. In fact, let's take a look at that statute again about estrays. And, and again, the statute on estrays that defines estrays, it doesn't suggest that estrays are ownerless. What it says is that an unbranded 
horse or cattle or whatever that's on open range isn't astray. It doesn't say that there. And in fact, what does the brand inspector do? The brand inspector is charged with determining ownership in that case. And whoever has the astray can actually be cited for letting their, their animals out. But it doesn't suggest that there's no owner. Is it enough for the prosecution of this crime to establish that Mr. Hunt knew that the horses that he gelded <coughs> did not belong to him? I, I Certainly it supports um, the state's case, but there was more. I mean, Alan Bailey himself. But I'm just wondering if it's even necessary to have Mr. Bailey testify, yes, that horse belonged well, to me. Well, that certainly shoots down Mr. Hunt's uh, claim of vagueness. I mean, he knew, he knew whose horses they were. He went to Mr. Bailey for redress. Uh, Mr. Bailey had told him, that's all of his testimony, so I, I think that might be enough. But, but again, we have more. I mean, we have Mr. Bailey who testified to that. We have the registration papers in, in a prior owner's name. What we know is not, he didn't get permission from Mr. Bailey, nor did he get permission from the person that, that sold it to Mr. Bailey. This horse was owned. And if you look at Title 76, <coughs> it doesn't reference Title IV at all, and in fact provides its own definition, of, as Judge Harris noted, uh, of what livestock are. And it's a straightforward, there's nothing vague about this statute, and there's nothing in the statute, certainly, that requires the state that the only means of proving ownership is through brand inspection. Although that method would surely work. Sure, sure. I mean, no doubt. I, and, and the whole purpose of that is so that folks in the, on, on the open range can determine what's theirs and what's not, and to prevent cattle rustling and so forth. And if folks follow that, it makes it a lot easier. But uh, it's my understanding that there's plenty of cases out there where there's a dispute about livestock ownership, for example, when somebody passes away and all of a sudden, okay, is it theirs or is, it, is the livestock theirs? And it ends up being a dispute and the courts settle those things, just like the courts settled it in this case. And if there are no other questions, the state would ask the court to affirm. Let me Thanks. ask about the value. Oh. Okay. Um, <coughs> because if, if, you know, val value is fairly straightforward when we're classifying crimes in a, threat, a theft context, for instance. Well, how much was the bracelet worth? And sometimes there will be a, uh, a dispute about retail versus wholesale, you know, if it has unique value to the owner, etc. cetera. Um, but it seems like there's a pretty good argument here that um, <coughs> confetti magic was not actually in regular use as a, a, a stud for fee and was a better, kind, kinder, gentler riding animal post uh, procedure than, than before. So how, how is it that we put a value, even assuming that, uh, that Mr. Hunt did wrong in gelding someone else's horse, it's a crime only if it had a, uh, a monetary damage to, the, uh, to Mr. Bailey. <coughs> Well, and I'm this, unclear on, you know, had he shot the horse, we'd know, we'd have a, at least a better feel for uh, uh, damage. What had he paid for the horse? He paid thus and so. Well, had it appreciated in value? Probably not. Well, then the monetary value of the loss is replacement value or the purchase price. It seems to me a lot sort of a lot more iffy here where you've got a horse that's perfectly fine before and after. It's just that it can't do certain things uh, now that it used to be able to do. Um, we can add one more case to our restitution cases now on, uh, on, on horse value. Um, first of all, there was testimony as to value from the state and that, that demonstrated a value far greater 
as a stallion than, than uh, a gelding. Um, what the statute says is the value of the horse, if you material alter it, um, then it's the value of the horse. W and, without and that, regard to what impact the alteration had on yes, the value? Yes, yes, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, and again, that's not Mr. Hunt's decision to make. Okay, I don't get to, you know, my neighbor's house would, you know, go up in value if he only painted it and, and redid the yard. And, and so I'm going to go paint it and redo the yard and, uh, you know, I'm going to paint it, whatever. You know, that's, that's the decision of the owner, not his neighbor. So the case here would be the same in your judgment if what Mr. Hunt did was uh, get hold of confetti magic, pierce his ears, and outfit him with a couple of diamond earrings. The horse has been altered without the owner's permission. That's and right. Even though with diamond studs now in its ears, it's worth several hundred dollars more post procedure than it was before, that doesn't matter. It's the value of the horse that matters. It, it is the value. Pre, pre earrings. It is, it is the value of the horse. And that, that's what the legislature has said. I'm not, I'm not making that up. But at trial, the state put on evidence of before value and after value. If yes. it's just about the value of the horse, why put on the after value? Um, well, that ended up going to the restitution, ultimately. And, and, and of course, uh, so, so, and restitution is a complete, restitution is meant to compensate for damages. All right, but there was, but, uh, there was evidence presented of the sort of the delta. Sure, between what the yes, there was. was. Yeah. yeah, but again, that goes to restitution. It doesn't go to the degree of the offense. And, and defendant's claim is that, well, the jury must have taken the value of the horse at $1,500 that he gave of after and it was, and the, and the testimony was zero before. Well, we don't know what the jury decided. Um, and, and, and this court can't speculate as to what the jury decided. The question is, is whether or not there was sufficient evidence to support the verdict. And when it comes to the degrees of the offense with respect to wanton destruction of livestock, it's based on the value of, of that. And as long as there's enough, you know, these others, the, 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 the smaller amounts are lesser included offenses. So as long as there was enough testimony and a basis for the ju jury to decide, for all we know, the jury said, you know, Mr. Bailey shouldn't have let confetti magic run at large. We're not going to even consider that. We're just going to look at the value of, of uh, the, the Palomino Pinto. Now, the testimony there was 2,000, but they could have taken off. They could have said, yeah, but we think that. So was your argument, as long as the jury's verdict was within the range of what the experts gave, as long as it's within that range someplace, that the evidence is sufficient? As long as the evidence, I mean, if, if, if there's evidence of a million dollars, that it's valued at a million dollars, and they come back with a verdict that only provides a class A misdemeanor between 500 and 1,500, that's sufficient. And I think. Uh, the court in United States versus Powell um, said it best when, let me find that if I could. Of course, when I want to find it, I can't find it. Um, Ba basically, we'll, we'll, what, the, we'll what they said is we don't know. We don't know what the jury, the jury might have made a mistake. They might have got the conviction wrong and made a mistake as to value. And it might have been a mistake. It might have been a matter of compromise or it might have been a matter of lenity. I mean, juries do that. And, 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 and that's the not a basis. Was looking for a felony conviction, right? What's that? The jury that? came back with only a misdemeanor. Yes, yes. So, so with that, the state would ask the court to affirm. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. McFarland, you have the, the last words. Thank you. So 
First of all, with respect to the evidence that was presented, most of the discussion has always been about this rogue stallion that's referred to as confetti magic, but the reality is the verdict was based on two horses. The Tobiano Pinto referred to as confetti magic and a younger Palomino Pinto. And in the verdict, there was no distinction between the two. But the bottom line is, even though some evidence may have been presented about the older rogue stallion's prior ownership, there was zero evidence of any kind presented with respect to the young Palomino Pinto that was just as much a part of the verdict as the older horse was. In other words, Mr. Bailey could not present evidence that he had done any more than lay eyes on that younger horse. He'd never had any kind of physical possession or control of it of any kind whatsoever. With respect to that whole idea of value, uh, and your example about the earrings, in our briefing we mentioned the idea and evidence was presented about an old mare out there that had curled hooves to the point that she was crippled and could hardly move. Now, we, she was unbranded, running at large, it's our position that she was in a stray. So the question is, if someone, a good Samaritan, attempted to help her out by trimming her hooves, that would be an alteration along the lines of what we're talking about here, and under the statute, the way the state wants to have it interpreted and applied, that would be a criminal offense, and the degree would de de depend on the value of the mayor. So one, of, yes. one question, just clarification. Uh, despite the fact that there were two horses being discussed at trial, your client was only convicted of one count, if I understand that. Is that right? One count, but it was combined value. Yeah. From start to finish, this was not... There was only one count ever. They yeah. started out alleging four horses. That's they got down to two, but it was combined value of all the horses they claimed was a certain amount. So okay. thank you. both horses were in, I think it's really important that we look at the language of section 4-24-303, uh, which states, a brand inspector as agent of the department shall verify livestock ownership by conducting a brand inspection during daylight hours, subsection one, subsection two, as after conducting the brand inspection, the brand inspector, if satisfied that the livestock subject to inspection bears registered brands or marks owned by the owner of the livestock, <coughs> shall issue a brand inspection certificate to the owner or owner's agent. And then, uh, what, what the state argued was that there was some reference to bills of sale, but what it says is that the brand inspector, as part of his brand inspection, if an animal is not branded, and there are some situations where animals are not required to be branded, but they still have to be brand inspected, and the proof of ownership is the brand inspection certificate, so the brand inspector can consider other evidence, registration papers, bills of sale, cancel checks, that sort of thing. But according to the legislative regime, it's only the brand inspector who has statutory authority to do that. I mean, we've got a separation of powers issue here where other law enforcement courts are trying to usurp the statutory authority that's been given to brand inspectors. And I think it's important that we look at the very clear statutory policy. Otherwise, if we look again back at 76-6111, what the state is arguing is that we should shift the burden of proof to the defendants to prove that they're not the owners. And it's our position that that is not what applicable law says. Appli applicable law says that the state has the burden of proving each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt, and you can't shift the burden of proof. With respect to the element of ownership, 76-6-111 is completely standardless. It doesn't say anything about standards or requirements to establish ownership. So one judge could require a brand inspection certificate. Another one could say, well, I'm just willing to go about with uh, Mr. Bailey's testimony that he laid eyes on this young Palomino Pinto and he surmised that he might have been the offspring of some horse, some mare out there that he might have abandoned and turned loose at some point in time, so that meant that he was able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he owned this young Palomino Pinto. I think it's important that we understand those facts. I need to hit one last point before I'm done, and that's with respect to animal control. I think if you examine the record very carefully, what you'll find is that Hunts testified 
that they called animal control on multiple occasions and that the animal control officer told them, well, if you see those horses and you have an opportunity, pen them up and we'll come get them. We will take care of them. They did that. The testimony, the record will show, the evidence, the unrebutted, undisputed evidence is they did that on multiple occasions. The animal control officer, Iron County Sheriff's Department, never responded. This went on for a period of time. And if you read the briefing, you know that it was a long-standing feud, if you will, bad blood between the hunts and the Iron County Sheriff's Department. It was their position that the Sheriff's Department would not respond to or assist them in any way. And it's their position that that's why that happened. It's their position that that's why they were prosecuted the way they have been in this case in a selective retaliatory basis. That's their basic position. And I think it's reflected in the briefing. So on that basis, I just want to thank the court for your time and ask that on the basis of all the other additional policy considerations that we've submitted, we request the court reverse the conviction against Jay Hunt. Thank you. Thank you. We very much appreciate the arguments from both sides. They do assist our understanding of the case. Uh, as is our custom, we won't rule today. We'll take the matter under advisement and let you have a decision in writing uh, when we're able to get that taken care of. And with that, court will be in recess. We will move, however, into our apex uh, event, Q&A, moderated by President Wyatt. Thank you all. All rise. The Court of Appeals is now adjourned. We hope that you can join us for our Q&A session. Please be seated. Well, we have um, a microphone right here. So anybody that's got a question, you can start coming up to the mic. And uh, I have 45 questions in mind, so I'll get through those if, if no one comes up fast enough. Um, anyway, thank you so much. This is fascinating for us to be able to, to watch this court in, in, in action. And as you mentioned, Judge Orm, um, it's a little nerve-wracking sometimes to be the one uh, arguing to you, and I've done that before. And I remember how you ruled. <laughs> Did you win? <laughs> um, actually, I don't remember how you ruled. <laughs> well, when, when we had lunch uh, together... But I remember the cases. Yeah. Um, I think we pieced together that you were... That you were, your, over, your lifetime record was two and one. You won that's, two and lost one. Bad. And that's not too bad. No, I, th I think that's pretty good. Well, we have a question. Yes. Um, I'm one of our criminal justice professors, and I want to thank you guys for coming yet again, um, as this has been a yearly tradition. Some of the students I have here are from my criminal justice management course, and we're talking about organization administration of courts right now. I was hoping maybe you could explain to them a little bit about how the courts in Utah, particularly the appellate level courts, are administered and, and what goes into that, things they may not know or realize. All right, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, Utah is unusual among states in that um, we have our um, we have a judicial council that governs the courts statewide, and uh, so instead of the chief justice of the Supreme Court basically running the court system, including things like budget and policy, we have a judicial council which has representative members from each level of court, including the justice courts, the juvenile courts, the trial court, which is known as the district court, the court of appeals, and our Supreme Court. And I sit on the Judicial Council. In fact, I'm the vice chair of the Judicial Council. And the council makes uh, spending decisions, budget request decisions, uh, what sorts of um, legislative action we're going to request from our state legislature, all of that sort of thing. We also uh, consider things like what to do about buildings and, and in some cases even personnel decisions, that sort of thing. And so we have a very different kind of structure. Uh, but each level of court, including our, our Court of Appeals, uh, is served by a, um, a court administrator sort of person, and then each of the courts has a clerk of court. And in fact, Lisa Collins, our clerk of court, is here with us today. And um, she, she's the one who really knows how all the paper moves. But I have to say that um, even though I had been an appellate um, 
advocate when, when I was in practice, and even though I had been a trial court judge before I became an appellate court judge, I had no idea uh, how things happen on that floor. Um, as far as the behind the scenes stuff, I knew this part, and I knew that judges in general spent a lot of time uh, reading and writing, but I had no idea um, all of the complicated steps that go into getting a case decided on appeal. We now have shifted to an electronic system from uh, a paper system, and so the world is changing a little bit in that level, but there's still enormous volumes of paper that go through our court. You want to add something? Okay. Well said. Hello, my name is Evan Miller. I'm a student here. I'm very grateful you come down to Southern Utah. I was really excited for this event. And my question for you is that what do you think the greatest constitutional issue is that Utah is currently facing in your experience? <laughs> Thanks, Greg. No? Wow. Uh, you have a stumped. You, you, yeah. And, and maybe it's because of the, the, the adjective greatest. Um, I can think of several. In fact, during the, we, we met informally with uh, some political science and, and pre-law students yesterday, and you came up with, the reason I turned to you is you came up with a good example about the, uh, the fishing rights case oh, under the Utah Constitution. Now, as I sit here right now, I'm not sure that's the greatest Constitution. Yeah, It's the most interesting, possibly. Well, I guess I can speak generally, is that working, uh, a little bit about uh, the fact that there's a federal constitution, but each state has their own constitution as well. We have a constitution of Utah, uh, and uh, our Supreme Court has, over the years, um, tried to develop um, constitutional law based on the state constitution as well. We have a number of unique provisions in it. Uh, there are a couple of cases we're watching uh, having to do with state constitutional issues. The stream access case that Judge Orm just mentioned is, uh, is one that's under advisement. A uh, question there being whether there's a state constitutional right to access public waters, even though even if those public waters are bordered by private land. In other words, if, if citizens have a right to access the rivers that are abutted by uh, private property, or whether private property owners have the right to exclude citizens from that, and whether there's a state constitutional right to do that. Um, there, there's also some other sort of unique um, provisions in the state constitution. There's a, another one we were talking about yesterday is a state constitutional prohibition uh, when the governor appoints judges from considering politics, which in light of what's been going on in Washington uh, recently is, a, is something that's of note, right? We, we have a constitution, constitutional provision here that prevents politics from entering into uh, the judicial appointment process. So there's a lot of interesting things about our state constitution that sometimes get overlooked. A lot of constitutional law courses focus almost entirely on the federal constitution, and that's, I, I know the reasons for that, but the Utah constitution's interesting too. So um, a very good question. Thank you. Uh, and that does allow, if I can, uh, um, we had argued uh, the other day a, a, a case um, because we have this two-tiered system in our federal system, we have the United States Constitution, which is supreme, but each state has their own constitution. We had an argument, we have it under advisement, so I don't want to uh, say anything about how we might rule on, but the argument was made there, okay, under the federal constitution, there are a lot of courts that have said that if you're just driving by a police officer and the police officer chooses to run your uh, license plate and sees that you've got outstanding warrants or insurance problems or a revoked license or the rest, the officer can investigate that. Settled law under the federal constitution. This clever attorney came in arguing under the state constitution. Uh, I want you to consider an enhanced right of privacy that citizens of Utah have. So even though the feds may think that's okay, under our constitution, uh, we want you to announce a rule that police officers cannot do that unless they've got some particular reason to be suspicious about the ownership of the car or the qualifications of the driver. Um, they can't just be uh, randomly running license plate checks. Clever argument. Uh, because it's not one that would have gotten out of the gate if they had to premise it on the federal constitution. Um, 
and I won't say any more than that because it's one that at least two of us are currently thinking about. Thank you so much. Well, someone's coming up. I'll throw out a question or a comment that um, it's interesting you go to law school, but you don't go to brand school. <laughs> and um, you've got a very interesting challenge because every single case is a different subject matter. We don't have uh, appellate courts of criminal or probate or whatever it might be. How challenging is it to have a completely different, potentially, subject matter every time, and you have to become an expert in every possible walk of life? That's part of the fun, though. Yeah, well, um, there's an adage that runs something uh, along this line. Appellate court judges are, are, are jacks of all trades and masters of none. And I was one of the original appointees at the Court of Appeals when it was organized uh, 31 years ago. And one of the things when the judges that were newly appointed, we, we, we had to sort of design our system and figure out how we were going to make our assignments internally and so on. One of the things we toyed with doing was, well, Judge Orm, you've done a lot of real estate work over the years. Maybe we should channel the real estate cases to you, because you know lots about that. On the other hand, you haven't done any criminal work in your whole entire life, um, but this judge has and that judge has. How about we send the, uh, the criminal law cases their way? Judge Garf, our first presiding judge, had for 20 some odd years been a juvenile court judge, and most of us didn't know beans about juvenile law. How about Judge Garf take the lead on those cases? And I mean, before the, the day was out, we came around to the view, no. Those specialties would become enhanced. They'd become stronger. Uh, litigants would not be getting the benefit of a three-judge perspective uh, in every case. That One judge, the so-called expert in that subject matter, would be making the decision, and the other two would be rubber stamped. So it is by design, and it's it's more times than not uh, that we, strange subject matters will come up. I've got a case I'm working on now that's all about the finer points of billboard placement within certain uh, yards or feet of freeway interchanges, ex uh, points of gore, et cetera. Nothing I did. Uh, when I was in practice, but understanding this overlay of federal regulations, state regulations, UDOT rules and regulations, uh, municipal uh, ordinances and all the rest to try and figure out which signs are permitted where, we rely so heavily on the briefs of the parties. You heard just the, the, the arguments, but we, we have uh, in the case that we just heard, these uh, well-written explanations of the party's positions, uh, including references to the cases and the statutes. So what basically happens, President Wyatt, is we become in each of these cases a short-term expert. We come up to speed, we read, we study, we get it. I'm never going to know more about uh, brand certificate law again in my career than I know right this second. <laughs> Uh, and three months from now, no offense to anyone, three months from now I will have forgotten it all. Because now I'm going to be caught up in the rules and regulations that govern dental hygienists and what constitutes malfeasance on the part of a dental hygienist in a case brought by the Department of Occupational and Professional Licensing revoking a dental hygienist license. And I'll master that subject matter, as will my colleagues. And then three months after that, we'll have moved on to something else. We, we do gradually improve our vocabularies, though. Is that true? <laughs> uh, hello. My name is Mark Spengway. I'm a student here, and I just want to thank you again for coming. Um, this is actually my second time attending, and I've really enjoyed them. Um, my question is, as Judge Harris, you briefly mentioned the political climate that uh, comes around. And I was curious, being part of the judicial system, uh, particularly Judge Orm, how would you say that your experience has changed in the 30 years you've worked in the judicial system given the outer broader political climate and how that affects your job day to day well i i, I will i didn't mean to take two questions in a row but i i will take this one because it has changed uh quite a bit we were joking with 
working. Was it working? Oh, okay. Uh, well, kind of forget that that happened then. The, uh, when I was appointed to the bench, um, we had to be then, as now, uh, confirmed by the Senate. And it took all seven of us approximately 45 seconds to be confirmed by the Senate. Um, a couple of wildlife commissioners went first, and then along came the seven of us, and we were followed by a new member of the Liquor Control Commission. And some, some senators said, I move that we approve these uh, judges. All in favor say aye. Wait a minute, I've got one question. Ask them how they feel about capital punishment. Senator Hilliard said, that's not an appropriate question. Uh, not only that, capital punishment cases will go st straight to the Supreme Court. It won't involve these people. All right, then I move we approve the seven judges of the Court of Appeals. And out we went. And that was that. Uh, these two had a much different experience. Twice. Twice. <laughs> and now our state Senate has got why I think they followed the example of the Senate in Washington and have gotten quite a bit more serious about their responsibility in confirming judges. So you spent more than 30 seconds or 45 seconds? Oh, yeah, yeah, and um, just to clarify um, what Judge Harris and I just said about twice, it's not that we failed the first time and had to do it again, it's that we had to go through this process to become trial court judges and then we had to go through it again when we became appellate court judges. But in, in our case, uh, what what we did was have to appear in front of a Senate Judiciary Committee for a hearing at which they took public comment, that sort of thing, and, and there were a couple of hours of questions from the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, before there was a full Senate hearing. And then at the full Senate hearing, it's not so much questions, but um, they do deliberate, and in some cases, they do not confirm. So it's, it's a big deal, and it's... Um, an ordeal. <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe it would be useful uh, to describe just for a minute the process that we have here in Utah for people to become judges. I mean, what we're describing now, the Senate confirmation process, is the very last step in the, in the, in the process. It starts with a very lengthy written application whenever a vacancy comes open. Uh, those applications are reviewed by an independent nominating commission made up of uh, usually three lawyers and four non-lawyers. Uh, for appellate court positions, it's a statewide commission. Um, people from all over the state come together and review these applications, and they narrow uh, the field down to either five or seven names, and those names get passed on to the governor, who they then... They also seek public comment. They seek public so comment. Paper and anybody can write in about you. Well, not only public comment, but specific comment from all the lawyers that the um, applicant has litigated against over the years. Um, and so, if, you know, if you've made enemies in the legal community, they're going to know about it. Um, that never that, happens. Yeah. <laughs> Not in a profession where you litigate against each other every day, no. Uh, and then the governor then picks uh, one name from that list, and then that name is then vetted by the Senate in the manner in which we've uh, described. But throughout this whole process, we have this overlay that I mentioned earlier, uh, a constitutional prohibition on the consideration of partisan political um, considerations, which is really quite unique. From start to finish, it takes about six months. So during that time, your life is really just completely up in the air. You don't know what's going to happen. And then uh, once we're in, we have to stand for retention election uh, every so often. Um, the ballots have been mailed out, so some of you have been vote maybe uh, um, voting already. Um, at the end of the ballot, it'll say, shall somebody... Uh, well, this year, shall Judge, yeah, judge Toomey, Toomey be, be retained as a judge, office. yes or no? So it's not, a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a contested election, it's just an up or down yes or no vote, and that uh, takes place uh, every, every few years, and, and if we're retained, then we'll serve another term. Um, so uh, another way to keep partisan political effects out of the system. Uh, and those terms are six years each on our court, which is why Judge Harris and I are not on the ballot this year, and Judge Toomey is. They end up being uh, scattered, although we've got a big contingent, I think, in two years that yeah. will be on the ballot together. And right. this year it's just you, yourself, and you. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, but you may have traveled to states like Nevada where um, the 
judges basically run against each other for the privilege of having this job, and they have to raise money and campaign. And uh, at any rate, we we are so fortunate in Utah to have the selection process that we have, um, which is by constitution a nonpartisan process, but also I think keeps um, safeguards us from the potential for corruption because you're not raising money and making promises. You're up. Thank you, sir. And I want to thank you. That's just a little bit low. <laughs> and I want to thank you. You're just a little bit tall. <laughs> that could be it, too. And I want to thank you all for being here. My name's John Pratt. I live up at Cove Fort. Um, have interest in the Hunt case because a lot of my business is horses. I recently put some horses in a sale over in Panguitch just a month or so ago. And it's interesting to talk to my brand inspectors because the way, in other words, I've got both some comments here and lead up to a couple of questions. Um, the way that it's been for a number of years, the laws have been there and the inspectors have been there, but it has not been pushed really, really hard. And here just recently, the governor's office, you know, basically, I mean, my brand inspector said he basically hammered on them and said, look, you guys have got to start paying your way and you've got to start really towing the line on what is already in the law. So they had to raise their rates and they've had to do a bunch of different things. It's also become tradition, probably wrongly, but, you know, hum, hum, humane speaking, rightly, to not brand horses, you know, personal owned horses, even though it's a law. In fact, is one of them told me there's a law in the books that says if you own a horse for X amount of time, by law, you're supposed to brand it. So here recently in the sale that I went to, you know, we have to have brand inspections, but most of the horses are not branded. So then what it comes down to is, is your local brand inspector knowing you, knowing me, and saying, okay, John, I know you. I've known you for 20 years. I know you're a legitimate businessman. You're above board. There's no complaints. So if you tell me this is the way it is, there's credibility. Um, so I guess my question on that regards is, if there's a law in the books that's not been pushed for a while, it doesn't change what the law is. If, if a case comes up, you have to fall back to the law, right? Not tradition. So that question, and then I've got one more. If there's any, no, no, more. And by the way, this is a golden opportunity, folks. There's a lot of wisdom here. I, I'm a firm believer in transparency in government and transparency in courts. Line up here. Have some questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, if your question is, if a law on the books remains on the books, hasn't been repealed, is it? But just hasn't been used in a while. Is it still good law? Right. I think that's your question. Yeah, the answer is yes. Because until until the legislature the, the repeals it. Going on in that case is. Like what I just went through for the horse sale, um, we have to fulfill the law. Now, we can't run a horse through an auction without having a brand inspection. Can't. Well, I mean, the way our system is put together is the legislature passes the laws and, and we interpret them and, and right. make decisions about what they mean. And, and your recourse would be through your legislative yeah. representatives. Oh, I know. I'm all for it. I think that's <laughs> the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> and I will point out there, there are some, some uh, I, w I wouldn't call them exceptions necessarily, but there are some areas in the law where the fact that a law is on the books um, uh, is a kind of relative. And I'm thinking of, uh, this was, I believe, a, a, a federal case, although it could have been a state case because uh, both courts, I can see a situation in which they might be involved, but uh, 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 one, or more polygamous, and I think it may have been the polygamous that's involved in the reality TV show, went to court seeking to have um, Utah's felony polygamy statute declared unconstitutional, because there is a law on the books. And I think, it, maybe it's a misdemeanor, but I'm pretty sure it's a, 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 a felony to be married in a polygamous relationship. And uh, he wanted that law declared unconstitutional as a violation of his religious freedom right. And if memory serves, the federal judge said, well, is there a realistic threat of prosecution? And uh, the, Fed, the US attorney, in con consultation with the attorney general's office, I think, uh, came in and said basically, no, we, unless there's child abuse or underage marriage involved, 
we haven't prosecuted grown adult polygamists in umpteen years. So yeah, the law's on the books. It hasn't been repealed. That's the legislature's call. Whether or not we actually prosecute anybody for violating it is an executive function. That's a prosecutor's call. And we haven't prosecuted anybody in a long time. So they're just asking you to resolve a dispute that doesn't exist. And if my memory serves, uh, that federal judge said, well, I'm going to dismiss the case then. Because if the law is there and on the books, but it's not actually being used, um, you haven't got a real case or, or controversy. And I believe it was uh, dismissed or ruling deferred or something. So occasionally laws on the books that are just sort of sitting there, um, whether or not they will have any effect and meaning can, can vary based on uh, some other facts and circumstances. And that actually leads into my other, oh, what it's just now just immediately become two questions. So I'm on my sheriff search and rescue up there in Millard County, and a while back our under sheriff gave us a presentation on, and I don't remember what he titled it, but it was on constitutional sheriffs. And his point was, is, is that the sheriff's office in Utah is not written into the state constitution. And he says there are some states that it is, but there are, you know, he said actually of most of the states it's not. And so my question is, and, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, is there a difference in jurisdiction or in authority or in power between a sheriff's office that is written into the state constitution and one that is established legislatively? Let me say I think we probably should not opine on that, um, but... Um, but just for the benefit of the audience, there, there is some view that, that um, constitutional sheriffs are able, able to declare what the law is. Well, and th there would be, be this difference too, probably not in terms of function. I think whether a sheriff uh, holds office and exercises powers pursuant to statute or pursuant to constitutional uh, mandate in an everyday law enforcement context may not matter. Where it would matter, and a, a better example here is the Utah Attorney General is a, a, a constitutional officer. I believe that position is created by constitution. In some other states, that's a, a statutory office. And so the legislature could say, you know what? Um, the Attorney, a, Attorney General is, uh, uh, that's kind of a waste of taxpayer dollars. Let's, let's uh, repeal that office and just farm the legal work out to law firms that can bid on a contract basis and have them do the state's legal work. In states where it's just entirely up to the legislature whether there is that position or not, the legislature could do that. In a state like Utah, where the office exists by constitutional mandate, the legislature couldn't purport to repeal the office. That would require a, a constitutional amendment. And then, last question. I and now promise. you do have somebody behind you. There we go. Good. Yay. Um, last question, which is kind of tied together. I agree completely that the federal constitution is our supreme law of the land. And the way I understand that is, is, is that anything that tries to, you know, go a, a law is basically null and void if it goes against the federal constitution. I mean, that's the way I understand the supreme law of the land. So how does it work in a state like Colorado where they legalize drugs that are illegal under federal law. Yeah, stay tuned on that one. <laughs> I, I think we're all wondering how that's going to work out. You know, and, so uh, the, and we'll just have to see that work out in the wash, I guess. So. One of the challenges is that you, if there's a dispute that is building like that one, you can't ask a judge for the opinion. Because judges don't give advisory opinions. They, they only give opinions when the case is ripe in front of them. Gotcha. So right. you're getting but a I little. Think we are all curious to see how that's going to play out. Okay. Next up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you. All right. Am I like, too close? Okay. Um, once more, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming down to our university and allowing us to experience this proceeding. But my question is, how do you, as judges, like what steps do you guys take to eliminate um, your biases before you enter a courtroom? Because I feel like that, to me, would be difficult to be able to look over the case to see the arguments from both sides and to not feel a certain way not to presume guilt or innocence. 
So what do you guys do to keep yourselves neutral until you've heard all the facts, until you've heard both arguments? Be before, you <laughs> before you start answering, I think this is our last question based on the time. Well, let, let me just say that I, um, we're receiving a lot of training these years uh, about the role of unconscious bias, which apparently everybody has. Uh, and, and has been uh, measured and studied and quantified by social scientists. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, and it's a very evolving uh, area of training for us judges. Uh, and one of the things that I've learned is that the first step is awareness. Well, I think uh, we all do have biases, and there are some biases that are um, in a sense, understandable, predictable, a, a part of the deal. So each of us probably came into the courtroom today having read the briefs and thought about this case with our minds sort of tentatively made up or inclined to go one way or the other. Uh, you know, in, in uh, it, layman's terms, maybe with a bias in favor of one side or the other, but that's not an inappropriate uh, bias. That's a bias that, say, uh, a really maybe predilection is a is a is a better word for that. It's a result of study and thought, because um, there's a point to doing this work before the oral arguments, and that's to begin thinking about an appropriate resolution for the case. So that kind of bias, based on experience and and education, is fine. The kind of bias that's not fine is uh, the kind that is, oh, well, you know this kind of person almost always guilty. Or, you know, e as appellate judges, we have to resist this temptation. Oh, you know that judge over in this, that, and the other court. What a loony bird he is. Um, and, uh, you know, if that was, if it's that, if that's the judge who ruled, it's probably going to be screwy. Well, no, we cannot be deciding cases based on on that basis, due to people's uh, background or ethnicity, their gender, their race, their economic circumstances, uh, judges, trial judges that have great reputations and maybe lesser reptations. And I think maybe Judge Toomey uh, touched upon this, awareness is a big part of it. Um, we, we need to actively think about making sure that we're not biased in a case. And hardly a month goes by that one or more of us, when we get our copy of the calendar and see what panels we've been assigned to in what, and what cases we've been assigned to help decide, not a month that goes by that some judge doesn't look that over and go, oh, I've got a conflict there. Uh, I represented that person when I was a lawyer. Or I know the trial judge too well to have an open mind about whether or not she abused her discretion in, in sentencing the defendant in this way. Or these are friends of my family. Um, yeah, and we each have recusal lists, and it makes um, Ms. Collins' job a complete nightmare uh, <laughs> to make sure that cases go to judges who can actually hear, hear them. Um, because we do recognize that there are circumstances in which we're not going to be able to be objective. And so we each have our recusal list. Uh, and we take that so seriously that occasionally there will be a case uh, that we're told it has to be this panel. You three are the only judges who have not identified a, a conflict or some uh, reason for needing to bow out on this one. So it's you three or find a trial judge to come right. up and, and help you. So it, it's, it's a responsibility that we take very seriously and try and do whatever we can to make sure that cases are decided based on the facts and based on the law and not on inappropriate bias. And let me also chime in and go back to your question. You know, we all take an oath when we take the office to decide cases impartially. And um, sometimes that's hard, right? I mean, sometimes I was a trial judge, so was Judge Toomey, and, and uh, you know, there are, are times as a trial judge where you know you have, let's say, it's a landlord-tenant case right before Christmas, and the law is all on the tenant side, and and uh, or maybe all on the landlord side. I, excuse me, all, law usually is uh, all on the landlord side, and 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 I'm sitting there on the bench realizing that the law is requiring me to evict this tenant on December 21st. And, and do I want to do that? 
No. Do I wish I didn't have to do that? Well, yeah, but that's the law that the legislature has passed and somebody's coming in and they have a legal right to, to do this. And, well, and landlords need to get paid. Yeah, and those are hard decisions to make, but ultimately we have to, it's part of our job, it's part of our oath to apply the law in an impartial way, even if we might be sympathetic to one side or another. If the law requires that outcome, we have to go with it. And it's just a matter of sort of understanding that as part of your job and also getting used to that and, uh, and making sure that you are aware of it and, and, and that you that you do it when it's required. Thank you so much. I, I'm hoping we've got enough time that I can ask a question that you can answer in one sentence each or two sentences. We've got a lot of young people here studying to uh, go to law school or be involved in government someday or participate in, in our form of democracy. Um, in, in one or two sentences, what would you say? Go for it. Public service is just the best. That was two sentences. Very Sorry. good. Yeah. Um, I was trying to keep it to one. <laughs> you go next, Ryan. Well, I, I would encourage you, if that's what you want to do, uh, go for it. Uh, follow, follow your dreams. Uh, going to law school is something that is a really flexible thing to do. You can do a lot of things coming out of law school. Uh, and uh, there, wh whatever... Wow, hope that wasn't me. Whatever your interests are, you can find a fulfilling job uh, uh, with a law degree doing it, whether that's in government or, or outside of government. Um, you can make a difference in the world, and I, if that's what you want to do, you should go for it. Remarkably enough, that was exactly two sentences. <laughs> well done. Those were Falconerian sentences wow, then, right? yeah. I mean, I was picturing commas, uh, hy double hyphen, semicolons, <laughs> but it, it was two sentences. No, I would agree, and I, 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 I was going to make the point that Judge Harris just did, which is that if your interest lies uh, in politics and government, uh, follow your dream. It may be that you're a little bit challenged post-graduation in finding the right job. I was a political science major. I went to law school, it all worked out, but I have friends who were in political science that didn't go to law school, and they work in local government, they work in state government, a couple of them ended up as the officers of banks, um, and, and, and a lot of times having the degree is what, what's important to, as an entree to some jobs, so why not get that degree in something that will hold your interest and help you get good grades for four years, rather than something you're not that that interested in i i just want to add or just throw out that um i guess i practiced law as long ago as about 30 years shortly after you went on the uh, appellate court bench and it strikes me that the quality of judges and the effort to which they take to be fair and impartial and the degree to which we're all trying to train one another has continually improved. I think in this area of the world, we continually get better. I hope that's right, and I, I tend yeah. to share your assessment that it is. Yeah, so thank you very much, all three of you. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank, thank you. you.